For the Office of Civil Defense, or OCD, one cannot stress enough how important it is to ensure structures in the country are not only sound, but also disaster resilient, with the possibility of a strong and deadly earthquake happening anytime. That's why the OCD continues to harp about the importance of compliance to the National Building Code as part of government's disaster preparedness and mitigation efforts. Undoubtedly, many buildings will collapse when the so-called big one strikes, but authorities want to ensure that at the very least, when that gloomy scenario does happen, many will survive. Simply because the buildings they occupied were soundly constructed and designed to not only withstand the wrath of nature, but also have enough safety nets to make sure many do not perish when the whole structure collapses. With this in mind, building design, which is the very task of an architect, is very crucial and, frankly speaking, can be the very difference between having to deal with a very tragic outcome when a calamity happens or a scene that allows many to rise from the ashes and rebuild towards a better future. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have arguably one of the best minds in the country when it comes to urban planning and architecture. Architect Felino June Palafox Jr. Good evening, Architect June. Yeah. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence on PTV News tonight. Yeah. Good evening. Glad to be here, Charles. Thanks. Yes. Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad you're back. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes. So, um, the, the, the concepts of urban planning, uh, sustainable infrastructure initiatives, these are key words that we'd like to focus on today as well. But right now with the country and uh, I would say globally, many nations are being rocked by disasters such as strong earthquakes, flooding. What do you think is needed design-wise to ensure that our buildings and structures, especially also in the city, are made in such a way that uh, accidents or fatalities are minimized? Yeah. It's, uh, I've written a book, The Philippines uh, Towards Resilient Cities and Communities, and I got the Best Author Award. And the thesis of that book is it's 90% less expensive to address the hazards before they become disasters. And aside from saving human lives, buildings, infrastructure, agriculture. So we should address, we already know the hazards, and we know also the solutions. And I think I, appear, I appeared more than twice in the Senate already to talk about the building code, structural code. It's not just architects. Architects, structural engineers, uh, mechanical engineers, uh, sanitary engineers, fire protection engineers. It, it, it's a team. And I've said that we may have to revisit the building code and the structural code because with the 7.2 magnitude, a JICA study in 2004, in their study, they said that 7.2 magnitude in Metro Manila, 50,000 people will get, get killed. That's 2004 data. Mm -hmm. And thanks to the media, there's more awareness now, but we should really uh, be prepared for it. And the buildings we design, we, we design it at least more than 10% the building code, above the building code. And it can be done, it can be designed properly. And about tall buildings, in that JICA study, 3% of tall buildings will collapse, but more than 10% of low-rise buildings will collapse. You might want to ask me why. Because yes, the, why? The tall buildings, they are designed better. Mm. Like the buildings we've designed, tall, we, we go to earthquake analysis, um, uh, wind tunnel analysis, and so on. And we've, design, we've been asked to design buildings for magnitude 10 after the big earthquake in Iran, and for an uh, buildings that would last a thousand years for buildings we are asked to design in Kathmandu after the big earthquake. Okay, well, you have sort of led into my next question, Architect <laughs> Palafox, uh, which is great because we'd like to ask, uh, with the big one you know, being forecasted to be just around the corner and uh, also with the possibilities, as you said, that 10% of low-rise buildings building. will actually collapse as yeah. in comparison to maybe 3% 3% for tall taller building. buildings because they're they're uh, better built like yeah. you like you mentioned um, what would you then add to the national building code to uh, maybe key points that would actually help us be more prepared for these upcoming disasters you 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 increase the uh, uh, address a higher magnitude mm -hmm. than 7.2 mm -hmm. and and uh, it would save lives 
Another concern is buildings that were not built properly, like not following specifications. Like in the latest uh, Super Typhoon Odette in Siargao, the building we designed was not damaged at all. And we also master planned the whole island of Siargao. And it can be done by design. Yeah. So it's not enough to say it was an act of God. <laughs> not true. <laughs> Even the one that happened in Dubai, right. it's not an, it's not an, it's, it's, it's explainable why it's happened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, as you mentioned, uh, the flooding in Dubai was um, also extremely catastrophic. So with the Philippines going through 20 and plus more typhoons and uh, a lot more violent storms, might I add, how can the country um, continue to build structures that would prevent these kinds of scenarios from happening? You mentioned earlier, and I, it's very important to point out, that you said it's much cheaper to address the hazards first. 90% mm -hmm. less expensive yeah. before they become disasters. Like comparing, Dubai I was part of the urban planning of Dubai. And, and uh, the desert storm rains was more than almost twice the rainfall that Dubai gets throughout the year. And before Dubai was developed, the desert storm rains would uh, percolate to the ground. Because until 1965, Dubai did not have a single kilometer of paved road. Now it's paved roads is still in concrete. Mm -hmm. Coming back to Metro Manila, the reason why there's more flooding now, like the higher ground, like, uh, like Fort Bonifacio, it used to be grass. Mm -hmm. Now you have concrete, so you have a larger run of water coming down and so on. And I described this after Ontoy because the solutions were put forward in the mid-70s. They were never implemented. The mid-70s? Mid-70s. Okay. I, I, I was part of it because I was team leader, senior planner for the World Bank funded Metro Plan Manila. Mm -hmm. And many of those uh, recommendations until now not implemented. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is another conversation to be had. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so let's go back to current, uh, well, move on from weather disasters and also talk about what everybody's complaining about, which is the extreme heat. Um, we are now experiencing surging temperatures that are beyond what we've seen, uh, maybe even beyond the past five years. And we're now looking at dangerous heat index classifications of temperatures, sometimes even reaching 47, almost 50 uh, degrees Celsius. How can urban design, and I would say, planning help in reducing these heat health risks. As you mentioned earlier, Metro Manila has now become a paved jungle. Um, so yeah. how, do we, how do we start to begin with? Yeah, <laughs> we need the lungs of the city. Okay. 1979 Metro Manila zoning code, uh -huh. there were more parks and open spaces. Unfortunately, some local governments have allowed the reclassification of parks and open spaces and to build the bold saleable areas. That's one. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been advocating that every car you own, you must plant 10 trees to recover the oxygen out of the carbon monoxide per car. So if EDSA Corridor has 500,000 vehicles per day, EDSA Corridor should have 5 million trees. Ayala Avenue is about 70,000 cars a day. Ayala Avenue should have uh, 700,000 trees and uh, other than that uh, we have there are urban planning wise we should be able to to address those also even our building code you could build, build high-rise buildings less one meter apart mm -hmm. even earthquake wise they could bump each other in Singapore the buildings in Singapore hundred percent open space because the footprint of the building they put sky gardens on the rooftop. So they compensate for the, for the lack of it. Uh, island heat effect also, because too much concrete and so on. We could, we could address, we've designed 11 schools in BAM Iran, uh, bringing back the wind tower of the Middle East before they discovered oil. Cuts the wind from above, ventilate the rooms below, cross ventilation. I'm told it's 20% low, uh, uh, lower degrees during summer, uh, 10 degrees lower in autumn. So by architectural design, green building principles, they can be addressed. Wow, okay, we just have to get started then. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, 
I have recently um, discovered a UN Habitat report that says there is now a phenomenal shift. Well, we don't need a report to know that, but um, looking towards the numbers, there is now a phenomenal shift of um, urbanization. They say that five out of every ten Filipinos are now moving to live in the cities, and we're now looking at, um, I would say, 84 percent of individuals moving uh, in, in, in a citywide population by 2050. Of course, one of the biggest impacts of this is traffic congestion. And I think, in my opinion, my humble opinion, this is also um, the traffic woes that we see out there is also a result of a lack of urban planning. <laughs> so this has been a tremendous crippling, uh, I would say, obstacle in the lives of many Filipinos. And it has cost our daily lives to be, um, I would say, wasted <laughs> on a daily basis. How can we address the traffic congestion right now? I mean, we have so many bridges being constructed. We have so many skyways. We have a lot of plans for the subway. Um, what would architect Palafox yeah. do to start? Again, <laughs> mid-70s. Yeah. We had addressed land use, uh, transportation, and traffic. Again, most of those recommendations not yet implemented. Mm -hmm. Subway proposed in 1974. Uh, Metro plan, which I was team leader, World Bank funded, we should have completed eight LRT lines by 1992. And Vision 2050, which I've been advocating in my talks, we need 100 new cities outside Metro Manila with 150 million Filipinos by then. If we don't do that, cities, the rest of the country will become as bad if not worse than Metro Manila. So it should be comprehensive planning nationwide. And a, a study in Harvard, I was in Harvard, year 2000, Metro Manila was the fastest growing metropolis in the world. 60 persons per per minute or Mumbai was only 47 persons per wow. minute in mostly in migration London Paris New York seven seven persons per minute mm -hmm. Moscow negative five per minute that was year 2000 and because of the lack of, of job opportunities and provinces people migrate here mm -hmm. and 2050 more than 70 percent of Filipinos will be urban population yes so um, I think one of the biggest challenges as well, um, as far as urban planning is concerned, is how do we balance national and local government um, interventions with addressing the quality of life, uh, uh, increasing the quality of life of every Filipino, and of course also balance that out with sustainable infrastructure initiatives or environmental um, preservation. Yeah. I, I was fortunate that I was hired by Asian Development Bank to help prepare the Philippine Development Plan 2023 to 2028. Mm -hmm. And I have shared there, there are like 32 modes of urban transportation. We have less than 10, more than 20 kinds we of- We have less than 10? 10. 10. Okay. Then uh, infrastructure, there mm -hmm. are 20 kinds of infra infrastructure. And the way we plan, it should be build better, verde, and blue. Okay. And there's such a thing as green infrastructure, green engineering, and so on. Mm -hmm. And, and the environment, uh, I'm, I'm also a registered environmental planner, just like you. Yes. And, <laughs> and there are solutions we know, but they are not implemented. If I may share here. The yes, please. The success of places we keep comparing, why not like uh, Singapore mm -hmm. or, or Dubai? I've worked with the rulers of Dubai. They have visionary leadership with strong political will good appreciation of good urban planning, good design like architecture, engineering, and excellent implementation. That should not just be for the national leadership, down to the barangay captain. Mm -hmm. They should have that. And Singapore, Dubai, they have good citizenship. So it's not just be leadership, but citizenship. And there's no continuity. Our planning here is short-term and opportunistic, not long-term and visionary. That's why at Palafox, we look beyond up to 2050, 2075, 2100. And, wow. and we are take pictures of the uglification of our cities, 
We design architectural perspectives. I call them postcards from the future. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, somebody will implement them. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, someone will adapt these blueprints. Okay, you mentioned something I liked, you know, a build better Verde, Verde and, and blue. blue. Okay. Now, as we know, the Marcos administration's uh, infrastructure program has these, this Build Better program, which aims to spur um, not just economic transformation, but also social transformation. What specific infrastructure um, projects do you think the government right now would be able to um, accomplish, to achieve and manifest, I would say, a better future for Filipinos? Yeah. Uh, there are six categories of infrastructure okay these are the progressive mm -hmm. these are the international airport and seaports right and airports and seaports are the business card of a city and a country first impression okay second is hard infrastructure we know that mm -hmm. the roads and utilities soft infrastructure the ease of doing business no red tape no corruption green infrastructure not just build 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 but plan 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 and then internet of things uh, uh, um, AI and, uh, and institutional infrastructure. We may have the best plans in the world, but we don't have the institutions to implement them. Nothing will happen. And it's really be yeah. planning is balanced. Our development is in balance. Like the central business districts, housing for employees, employees will price out. Mm -hmm. So employees working in Makati, BGC, they spend five to six hours a day in traffic. And I can speak from experience. Yeah, <laughs> you compute that, you would have lost 10 years of your life. Yes, that is correct. In, in traffic, mm -hmm. just like employees now in the central business districts are like OFWs away from their families five to six hours a day. Yes, we're just living in the same country. So it's yeah. just a matter of being yeah. stuck in traffic. You see, balance, jobs and housing balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, very quickly, there's never enough time when you are the guest in the <laughs> TV, but I'm just going to make this really quick. The Philippines is an agricultural country. What are your thoughts on uh, individuals saying that agrarian reform is actually stunting the economy and urban development? Again, uh, I, I've been advocating agropolis, agro the farm, police the city, mm -hmm. and they implemented our recommendations in India and Vietnam. Okay. And here, some of the leisure farms and so we're advocating that. We should also have urban agriculture. I've been told 8,000 hectares of Metro Manila are idle land. And as more progressive countries in the world, vacant land in the cities have higher taxes. Mm -hmm. So we are forced to make them into productive use, can be urban agriculture. Okay. And then kitchen gardens, the average mileage of, from, uh, from the farm to the table food miles, 2,000 miles. And the projects we've done, like in India, kitchen gardens, every house in the kitchen garden. Eliminating all those miles, perfect. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for your insights, architect June Halifax. Like I said, it's thank never you. enough time <laughs> when you are around, when you uh, interview a great mind, you gain a whole library. <laughs> thank you very much, we look forward to seeing you again.